Well, thank you very much for coming. I've been working on LLDB for about eight years, since, it, since before it was called LLDB. Um, most of that time has been spent working on LLDB's expression parser. You rec will recognize it as the expression command and EXPR for short. While I was doing this work, I came to a realization kind of over time. It was obvious right from the get-go that using Clang was a good idea. But we were using Clang as a box that was on the darker side of gray. Um, we were trying to build everything on top of Clang. But as I worked on it, I realized, you know, there's a lot of commonality between what we're building in LLDB and the eval feature that other languages have. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is what LLDB has that you could use to build eval. A couple of the trade-offs and limitations that we have because we used Clang as a gray box. And, uh, and I'd like to motivate the decision that maybe we should start bringing this functionality into Clang and LLVM at a more deep level so that we can start building eval-like functionality inside the larger e LLVM ecosystem. And finally, I'd like to kind of say, help us out, please. You know, we recognize there's a lot of things that need, still need to be done here, but I think they're gonna be wins for everybody. And I'd like to welcome as many people on board as possible. So, let's go back to the basics of eval. Let's say, you know, back in the day, you're the hip cat in your dorm room, and you have access to a list machine. You're not going to actually have a list machine because it's going to drain too much power, but, you know, maybe you get access to it in your department. Now, this list machine can take either interactive commands or it can take arbitrary strings and parse them into its abstract syntax trees, which it calls S expressions. And then there's a command which takes those S expressions and evaluates them in the global context. That means you can define new names. You can, def you can create new values by calling existing functions. It's a very powerful tool, but because it starts out in Lisp and is kind of, you know, which is a dynamic, somewhat weakly typed language, it got a reputation for being you know, this slightly unsafe thing that, you, that, that, wouldn't, who's, that wouldn't show its face in you know, type safe company. But that's not exactly true. Fast forward to now, you're the hipster in your coffee shop and you've got your Haskell machine. You can, if you, wrote, if you load the right libraries, you can actually use eval in there and you're not sacrificing the type safe nature of Haskell, and you're even getting Haskell's protection against unsafe side effects. Eval is compatible, at, at least notionally, with, the, with type safety. Now let's get closer to the topic of this talk, to LLDB. LLDB's expression command, on the face of it, looks very similar to eval. LLDB is debugging a target process usually you have access to the source code for that process, and you type in expression followed by some code which should make sense in the context where you're currently stopped, and LLDB made, makes that code run. Now, what would it take to make full-fledged eval work in C++? Well, first of all, let me assure you, this is a toy syntax here. I'm not saying that you know, this is exa exactly how it would look, but what I mean to argue is that LLDB has a lot of these pieces and that all we need to do is figure out how we want to expose them and put them together with what's exist what, is, what is already there in the parser. You need to be able to, first of all, reflect on the program that is running the eval. You need to be able to reflect on functions, you need to be able to reflect on variables, and you need to be able to reflect on types. That's sort of the core functionality that you absolutely need. 
because an eval which is just, you know, paste some code into a C file and run it is going to be kind of boring. The next thing you need to be able to do is synthesize the information that you have that you got from reflection into a consistent lexical context so that whatever parser you use, and I strongly recommend using Clang if you're using C and C++, that parser will be able to do sensible parsing. But that's not all, because then you're going to get these variables which are dangling references, and you need to bind them up with the physical locations of the values that exist in your program on the heap or the stack or registers or wherever. Finally, you need to actually do the execution. And, you know, again, with a nod to the fact that this needs to be safe, you may decide that you want to impose additional restrictions on the execution of the code that you eval. Now, LLDB does all of these things. It can reflect on the program that's being debugged using a wide variety of information, which I'll describe later. It can synthesize a lexical context out of that, which it presents to Clang via Clang's external AST source interface. It can then, after Clang produces some IR, it can modify that IR to link the variable references that it produces to the actual physical locations of those variables in the target program. And then it can execute the IR either safely or quickly. And I'll explain why that's a trade-off. <laughs> so all of these things are possible with LLDB. Now, why should they be inside Clang? If LLDB already does it, why aren't, shouldn't I just get off the stage and tell you to use Clang? Well, uh, to use LLDB, well, no, there are benefits to LLDB, first of all, from the integration. As I mentioned, the original approach to this was using Clang as a gray box. But that means that all of the testing for the LLDB-specific functionality has to be built at a higher level from Clang. Clang we know to be very well tested. LLDB has a bunch of testing, but it's tested in different scenarios. There are many diff there are many Clang testers that, aren't, that are run in environments that LLDB doesn't, doesn't even see. So the improved testing is already a huge win. The second huge win for LLDB is the, the close alignment of concerns that you would get by bringing the code closer to the parser. As I go into the details of LLDB's implementation, you'll see why it makes sense that each of these pieces should be closer to the Clang code that they're notionally building on top of. The bigger win, and the one that points towards the future, is the benefits for Clang. Clang gets from LLDB the building blocks to do in-process eval. It also gets the building blocks to build in-process embedded REPLs. And potentially, and also interestingly, is the, is the use of this for static analysis, binary analysis, looking at a particular assembly instruction and saying what's going on here in the context of you know, the symbolic information that you have. This gives you the potential to do new, new kinds of analysis that aren't possible previously. Finally, there's the benefits to the overall LLVM community of better functional decomposition and, and decoupling of the individual pieces. You know, you, as we look into these and figure out, okay, what parts should be in LLDB, what parts should be in Clang, what parts should be in LLVM, you'll naturally get a benefit of separated components that can then be put together potentially in new ways that we never thought of before. So let me draw, dive in, into more technical depth about the individual aspects of what LLDB does in the expression parsing space and you'll see as I go along why these are useful for eval. The first thing that LLDB does is reflect on the program that it, de that is, de it is debugging. LLDB's primary abstraction for a program being debugged is called a target. That target contains several modules, 
And I should be careful here because the, the term module is, un, is overloading the word module that you may know from LLVM. In this case, module means a fully linked image. That is to say your main executable or a shared library that, you, that you've loaded in. Each module potentially has a symbol file containing debug information. But that's not the only sources that LLDB uses. LLDB also can use the Clang modules from the SDK and the information from the Objective-C runtime that is maintained dynamically. Both of these are Darwin specific right now. Also, generically, it can look at all the object files that were linked together to produce your program, and it can read the symbols from them, and even if they don't have corresponding debug information providing types, it can still provide them for, for, for use as long as you cast their types correctly. Now, let me talk a little bit more detail about the symbol files which contain debug information. Broadly speaking, the symbol files contain two different kinds of information. The first is the line table. The line table is a mapping of assembly instructions to lines and columns in the original source code. This is useful not only for setting breakpoints, but also when a program is stopped, it's useful to determine where exactly in the original source code to to, to notify the user that a stop occurred. There's another piece of information that also in, exists in the debug information, and those are the scopes and types. Those contain a hierarchy of information. At the top level are the translation units, and under the translation units, there are the various functions that exist inside the translation unit. Each of those has a range of assembly addresses so that when you're stopped at a particular place, when the program is stopped, you can locate which scope you're inside. Once you know what scope you're in, you get the individual variables that exist in that scope. And each variable is accompanied by a physical location. In this case, the variables that we're looking at are on the stack. Finally, this information also includes information about um, the the types of the variables. It all, in this case, the type that's used is int, and so there's all exactly one type, but there are potentially very many types here. Now, we're looking at this and we're saying, well, isn't that enough? Why do we need all this other stuff? Um, it turns out that would restrict you in what you can actually use to exactly what the program used. Now, when you think about it, you know, you've got a large standard library. Your program may use some portion of it. While you're debugging, you may want to use more. But that's not all. In C++, you can instantiate templates. Let's say your program uses a vector of int, but in the debugger, you'd like to use a vector of bool. This, is, this makes even more sense if you're trying to use eval. You would want to be able to make new instantiations of templates. So you need something more. Additionally, and this gets more to the sort of technical details of Dwarf, you can't represent functions that, aren't, that are only inlined ever because those functions would then need to be recorded in the debug information with their full bodies in AST form. Dwarf isn't as rich as ASTs. It wasn't meant to be a replacement for ASTs for function bodies. So that's why this wouldn't work either. You need more information. Finally, not everything comes with debug information. You know, you may be the lucky person who has their entire operating system built with debug information. Lucky, maybe unlucky if it's if one, once you discover how slow that is. But um, in any case, you're likely to be dealing with li libraries that aren't built with debug information, even if you built your main executable with debug information. So for all of these reasons, LLDB can rely on other sources as well. The first is the Clang modules decal vendor, which uses the, Clang, the Clang's concept of a module to load header files in AST form 
for LLDB to use directly. In this way, you can get actu add actual inline function bodies, for example. This gives you full types for functions like printf or types like struct stat or variables like erno that exist in your SDK. But that's not all of the types that are floating around. On Darwin, you also have access to the objective C runtime, which can show you um, the definitions of classes that are implementation details that aren't exposed through the SDK, or classes that are generated completely at runtime, which, allow, which Objective C allows you to do dynamically. Finally, you also have access to the type to type information that LLDB synthesizes from bare symbols. Now again. That's an, inact, in, an inexact process. You're going to have to use casting to get those right. Now, what I want to emphasize is here is that this is not, a, not the easiest of jobs. You've got information that A is incomplete and B could conflict with each other. You know, the runtime may say one thing about the type of something, but the SDK might say, oh yeah, it's actually a subclass of that. You've, in, all, in all your cases, you've got to unify that information and generate some sort of consistent view. So there's definitely work to be done in this area of reflection. And I'd like to sum up by telling you kind of honestly what's going on here and what needs, what needs a bit more work. First of all, the type information readers need to have a consistent interface. That would almost automatically result in better testing for them because they'd let, let you do things make, and make kinds of tests that apply to all of them just executed slightly differently. So first of all, the, mo the most important thing we've been working on is moving the type logic that combines all of these different sources that makes those decisions I was telling you about earlier into Clang. Those of you who've been following the Clang commits mailing list will have seen I've been working on the Clang-import-test tool which essentially replicates what LLDB does as part of expression parsing inside Clang and tests it without you having to have an LLDB around. But there's much more that needs to be done. The individual readers also need to move to Clang. We've begun done doing this for Dwarf, but the Objective-C runtime reader also needs to move. And once they're in there, we need to make sure they all use the standard AST context interface. I've highlighted this one because this I would regard as a starter task. That doesn't mean it's easy. It means it's the kind of task you could dive into and, you wouldn't, and things wouldn't randomly blow up in your face while you're trying to do it. It's the sort of thing that you could use as a start, stepping stone to get deeper into the code. Another thing that we need to do here is make errors in debug information more clear. What's going on here? Why do we care about errors? Isn't debug information great and like generated by LLVM and so forth? Well, no. Debug information is kind of user input. It's something that you got from some compiler. Who knows, you know, is it, is, is it an old version of LLVM? Is it some other compiler? You, you just don't know. Maybe, the, maybe it got corrupted somewhere along the line. You will see errors regardless of what you do. Even, and you need to be able to communicate those errors sensibly to the user. And the most important step we can do to improve quality here is to work on the source location class that Clang provides that lets you communicate the location of something and allow it to communicate locations that exist in Dwarf. I wish I could label this with starter task, but the truth is that source location is a super hot class in Clang so this is actually something where I'd love somebody who has like Clang parser knowledge to give us some help on this because this would be a huge step forward and would also make LLDB's users much, much happier. All right, we've talked about reflection. Now let's, let's talk about how we coalesce all the information that we've gotten via reflection to make a sensible lexical context. For that, I'd like to demonstrate using a simple problem, simple example. Let's say I have a class and it has a method inside it and I set a breakpoint inside that method and then I hit. Now, I would like to run an expression in that context. Let's say this arrow y plus two. 
For that expression to make sense, you have to do a couple things, right? If you fed this to Clang, you'd get a bunch of errors. And the first and most obvious one is the missing semicolon, but there are a couple of others. Um, LLDB textually adds the miss missing semicolon and adds a function wrapper around, that, around the code, which at least makes that work. But it still isn't enough. Because now you've got this keyword, this, which can only be used in specific context. LLDB detects that you're currently in a class context, and it builds around this function a class wrapper. Now, you may say, what's with the, the weird name? In fact, that doesn't matter. The Clang external AST source API al allows LLDB to supply, when Clang requests it, the correct type for my class when, the, when Clang requests the type for LLDB class. This allows the class to get parsed correctly. In general, this infrastructure works fairly well. But there are, some, there are some corner cases. There are a bunch of corner cases. I'll tell you about one. Let's say I'm inside a lambda. OK, I've, got, I've set my breakpoint. And this lambda, it captured everything by value. That's what you, that's what you wrote in your code. Okay? And now you type x per z at the LLDB command line. Well, the lambda said it captured everything, but the way it was compiled, of course, it didn't use z. So it's not going to be able to provide z to you. Now, maybe in this particular case, you could look up the stack and say, OK, well, I know that I, z wasn't around then, but I can find it up, up, uh, up north. But that's, you know, imagine the lambda had been executed on some you know, asynchronous queue or something. This is a, this is a tricky problem. And there's no, there's no good answer here. There's no, there's no perfect answer. You know, and you, you could say, OK, I'm going to recompile the underlying code. But the problem is you already stopped in the code, that, and you, maybe you didn't know. So we need to do a little better. And I don't think we're going to get there by making everything, you know, every, everything work perfectly. But we do need to get a handle on all of these edge cases. And the first thing we need to do is we need to bring, this is, this is where bringing us closer to the Clang parser makes a lot of sense. Clang has decal contexts and you know, compound statements that represent contexts to parse in which contain names and so forth. It's the, I think the logical next step for the Clang parser is to do something that you already kind of need for things like code completion. You need the ability to parse in the context of a particular piece of code. You also need to improve error test coverage for all of the error cases. LLDB has currently you know, an unfortunate shortage of negative tests. We've got lots of positive tests that check that the stuff that we know works, works. But the stuff that we know fails, we don't have good tests that check that the, er that the errors make sense. This is something that would be a great starter task, and you'd really boost quality. Because there are a lot of times when you're implementing something clever, and you think, oh yeah, this, this, you know, the test suite continues to pass, no problem, and I've implemented this clever thing. But then when your clever thing breaks, it produces absolutely cryptic errors. And people hate getting cryptic errors, especially when they're already debugging something. So the, another thing that is a little bit subtler here, but that I alluded to earlier, is that currently the LDB's expression parser always assumes you're in Objective C++. And now what that means to most of you is just C++. And there are certain keywords like this that are only valid, that are only keywords in C++. If you're in pure C code, you'd like to be able to have a variable called this. Why couldn't the parser allow you to do that? Well, why couldn't it? Because we haven't made it do that yet. Um, it's not quite enough to make everything just x turn C. Uh, that affects the calling convention and maybe the mangling, but it doesn't affect anything about the, uh, about the keywords that are available. Um, so let's, let's move along. Now we've gotten from kind of the, through the clang end of things, and now we're starting to dig more into the LLVM end of things. Now let's talk about linking. 
Linting is an interesting problem for eval, and, it's also, and mu much of that problem is interesting for its expression as well. <laughs> Let's look at an another toy example here. A function that has three variables, one of which is an argument. And you, know, you stop towards the end of the function, so all of your er variables are valid. And then you run an expression that uses all of them. Once you've you know, generated the lexical context and gotten that to parse, you still have the problem that the resulting IR needs to be linked to the actual values of the variables. This problem gets compounded when you consider what an optimizer might do with the values. Let's look at x. x is an argument. x is probably in a register. Y, all right, that's an array, it's an automatic array. You know, thank goodness that's on the stack. It has an address, at least. And Z, even though we declared it as int, in point of fact, the function never modified it. So the optimizer is free to say, I'm forget about this. I'm not even going to allocate memory for it. I'm not going to put it anywhere. I only care about X plus Z. Uh, about X plus Z. So I'm just going to put in the debug information that Z was a constant and discard it completely. Well, that's wonderful, except, if, except when you want to run eval or expert. So LLDB has some mechanisms which it uses to get around these problems. The central concept that LLDB uses is of, this it, of a table in memory that it builds up that contains the addresses of all the interesting variables. Now, as I told you earlier, some of these interesting variables don't have addresses. What do you do then? You stick the temporary you stick the temporary values, the temporary memory that you allocate for these in, in place of the actual address. So that way, you're, you can take the variable out of a register and put it into temporary storage, or you can take this constant value that was stored in the dwarf and put it into some temporary memory, and then it does have an address that the expression can use. This allows you to treat these all the same. Let's look specifically at one of these, just so you can see kind of what IR level transformation is going on to make this work. Now, at the C level, let's, let's just pretend we're looking at kind of a C -like, uh, C++ like pseudocode. In that case, your, the way LLDB exposes the variable to the expression is as a static reference. Now, again, this is pseudocode. A real static reference wouldn't be usable uninitialized. But um, you, in this case, we do have a static reference. And whenever you use the variable, it's put into a temporary, which has the effect of dereferencing that reference. Now, the way LLDB modifies this is converting the IR to change the, vari the, the variable use into an array lookup. And then it casts the result of the array lookup to the proper double pointer type, dereferences the pointer to produce the reference, and then you can use the reference just as you did before. Now, for those of you who are more comfortable with LLVM IR than with C++, and I know there are some of you probably out there, um, there are, <laughs> there's, this is how it would look in LLVM IR. The static reference has been replaced with a global symbol. And that global symbol then LLDB replaces with the table lookup that I described to you before. Now, this is great and it works, but it takes time. One of the, re one of the things that people worry about when they're evaluating eval, sorry for the, for the, for the, for the meta there, um, is they say, well, it's kind of slow. And that would be true if you didn't have reuse. This is critical for, for reuse, right? Now you don't care about you know, what the exact value of the stack pointer is. You can, allocate, you can access these variables wherever they happen to physically be at the time you run the expression. And if you run through the inferior program for a little while and then you want to run that expression again, you just need to fill in that array properly again and then you can run it. So there's, this is very critical to running the compiler only once and reusing the expression as often as you can. 
But it would be nice if at least some of these memory and register locations could be communicated directly to Clang. So you don't have to fill in the table for everything, but only the things that really matter. Many of these things are always in the same place. Clang would, it would be great if Clang had the right annotations to allow you to do this. Now, as I said earlier, you're going to run into cases where you know, you're at different places on the stack when your, program, when, you're, when, when your program runs, and then you want to evaluate an expression and the frame pointer is different. So we still probably need to parameterize on one or two things. But the point is, with help from Clang, it would be much quicker to do this. There's another reason you might want to do this, and that is that some applications would like to jump directly into eval code without having to go through the intermediate of some runtime, like you know, in this case LLDB, that sets up that table or sets up the frame pointer information. You could envision doing this for instrumentation, for example. In this case, you actually need to use a special calling convention when you're compiling the expression so that it won't um, trample on all of the registers of the code that jumped into it. Thankfully, we already have a calling convention like that, preserve all CC. Now, LLDB does that job for, for you already. Finally, you'd like to do some binary analysis to, to find the appropriate jump, jump strategy. So let's talk about execution. Now, I mentioned earlier that execution can either be safe or it can be fast. Now, why is that? Well, to, do, to evaluate that, you have to consider the context in which LDB is debugging. There's the LDB process, and then there's the target. LLDB can run in safe mode, where only the program's data resides in the target, and LLDB simulates IR through its IR interpreter locally. I'll get to the IR interpreter in a moment. The fast path is if it JIT compiles the code, puts it into the target's memory, and lets it run as if it were anything else. Now, that, obviously, that code can, can stampede all over the target's memory, and there's no restrictions. So that's something you have to be aware of. This is a trade-off you'd need to make when implementing eval as well. But there's one thing I'd note. IR interpreter is different from LLI because it needs to be able to handle this cross-process um, memory access. IR interpreter does support you know, most arithmetic and flow control, but that's, it's kind of a lousy reason, right? IR interpreter should be the same as LLI, and I think bringing those together would already be a wonderful starter task. Um, additionally, the JIT could use a little bit of work to support other platforms as well as it does you know, Mac OS X. Um, improving JIT test coverage, especially for L3 locations, would be a wonderful task. And finally, you know, supporting Windows exceptions would be, you, know, you would make many people very happy. So we've gone through this talk, I've, you know, I've gone into some depth. Um, what can you do to help? Because ultimately what I want to do is have you come and join us and make, make awesome things on top of all this infrastructure. First of all, I encourage you to play with the existing functionality. So many people after talks like this tell me, I didn't know that LLDB could do that. Well, we can. And there's, there are other amazing tools out there like Kling, which, which also have related functionality that's absolutely mind-blowing. Please, get involved in the community. I mean, I, I kind of don't have to tell you guys this, but um, there's, there's the LLDB developer mailing list, there's the Clang developer mailing list, there are the Kling forums, nobody there bites. Please, you know, come help us out. Um, and finally, we're here at the developer meeting. You know, it's not just me. Uh, there's two hacker labs today, which I promise to be at um, later, right after this session and then later today. And then there's also going to be an LLDB future directions buff if you're kind of interested in the overall LLDB project. So please, come talk to us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, we're open for questions. Great talk, thank you. Um, so have you, have you thought about whether 
allowing the user that's writing the eval in in their application to set up the context explicitly and provide like the symbol mappings that are available to the context in eval instead? We considered something like that. Um, so again, remember, we're, we're coming this, at this from the direction of a debugger where you kind of want access to everything. In, in practice, we've erred on the, on the side of allow them to access as much as, you know, as possible. But you know, there are many cases like, for example, you know, D-Trace's implementation of, um, of, of, of uh, static probes um, and you know, X-Ray has similar facilities where you restrict and say, I want to give you specific variables, I want to give you specific types, and I don't want you reading any other memory. That's also something we've you know, considered as an option you know, for later on when this is becoming eval. Um, but from LLDB's perspective, we just haven't implemented that yet. Thanks. Hi, uh, thank you yes. for the presentation. Uh, I attended a presentation by Sami Barra from Backtrace recently, and uh, he complained rather bitterly about the fact that um, Clang in general, or LBM, doesn't annotate the dwarf object file with enough debug information to do essential things that tools such as Backtrace uh, require, that is far behind uh, GCC. So um, can you do um, something like eval and things like that without uh, first uh, taking care of the problem of fixing the lack of annotations in the dwarf uh, objects? Um, so I would, I would divide that into two questions. Uh, the, the first half of the question is, can you do meaningful eval on top of the dwarf that, L, that Clang already produces? And, I, and the answer would, for me for, would, for that would be an you know, unquestioning yes. You know, we built all of this on top of what Clang already has. So in that sense, you know, you can build very meaningful functionality with Dwarf as it is currently being produced by Clang. Now, the second half of that is, you know, are there features we can't deliver yet? Um, the, the biggest one, I think, is the instantiation of C++ templates that you don't have actually instantiated inside your process yet. And that's something where I think continuing to push on making C++ modules a real thing that, 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 that is that where, you can read, where you can read the module information, not only kind of for the STL, but also um, for, mod, for, for types that are defined inside your program is gonna be a huge benefit. Because there, like, Dwarf is never gonna give us enough information to be able to instantiate all of STD vector. You know, that's not what Dwarf's job is, that we have to find an alternative. I hope I've answered the question sufficiently. Hello, uh, just have one question. Uh, the, the reflection you use is, like you said, based on Dwarf mainly. Uh, most of, let's consider Evol in C++ being used by, I mean, lots of applications. Lots of applications aren't uh, provided with Dwarf symbols. They take many, too many places or give too many information. Do you think we can come up with some uh, format or some format information that allows this reflection, uh, but is maybe smaller and could maybe usable for many people more than Dwarf? I think I would prefer to look into that uh, in the context of trying to come up with a stable, a stable serialized AST format. Um, I think you know debug information is great, but uh, and and I think you know that. But that has specific uses, not just for LDB, but for a variety of tools. And I think try, if, if you make, end up making choices that either make that bigger or make that you know, differently usable, then I think there are a lot of stakeholders that won't be happy with you. I think the best way to approach the limitations in Dwarf um, is to say, OK, let's separate out what, we, what people actually rely on Dwarf for versus what people would, might want to use for you know, something for essentially being able to deserialize the entire AST from a data file. I think I would like to see a compact, a, a compact and you know, somewhat complete representation of ASTs, but I think that would be different from debug information, um, and I think that would be a benefit too, because that way you don't, you, you don't end up having to go through you know, the process of standardization, which can take a long time and has many, many more stakeholders than just the LVM community. 
Thank you, thanks. Sure. You mentioned source locations for things in Dwarf. Is that, I, I saw that it was about diagnostics, but is it only for diagnostics, or do you have other uses in mind as well? I would say it's primarily for diagnostics. Um, in practice, the quality of diagnostics turns out to be essential for just even day-to-day -day use of the expression parser, even when it isn't bugging out. Um, and you know, if, even if you have perfect debug information, you're going to use some API, and you're going to pass the wrong argument into it. You know, this is something you do in regular C++ coding all the time. And then if you type expert and you want to call some function that you don't remember the signature of, and you get it slightly wrong, what you don't want it to say is like, you passed the wrong type for argument two, and argument two is over here, blank line. That's the, that's, that's the number one case that I'd like to make things that I'd like to make better. The number two is, you know, you have bad debug, debug information for this, for this thing that you're trying to call, and we, you know, we want to provide information about that. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So another starter task that we might be able to add to the list is, you know, as we get this debug information coming from modules, like the full definition for an inlined, you know, for, S, you know, for STL classes and that kind of stuff, we still end up with the JIT asking us, hey, where is std vector int erase? And we might say, uh, I don't know, because it's not, it hasn't been there. But you know, one of the starter tasks is also modify the JIT to, when it asks for that function, say, please inline it for me if I don't have it. If I respond, I don't know where that function is. So that's another great starter task for anyone looking to help improve the expression parser once we can supplant the information with the information from the modules and this is actually really, others. that's actually a really fantastic point because the JIT is currently kind of at a, at a very significant point in its development. Um, though, you know, many of you have heard about the ORC JIT. Um, the ORC JIT has this capability of calling out when there's something that's undefined and trapping into, you know, something which either could be the debugger or, you know, some other front end provider of, um, of IR and saying, okay, you know, Somebody's calling about this. Can you find it somewhere? Um, that would allow much faster and much higher fidelity expression parsing if that were if, you know, if that were all wired up properly. So I completely agree that that's a it's a great time to do that. All right. So um, we're out of time. So yeah, thanks, yep. Sean, for the talk. Please come if back. If you have any sessions. more questions, thank you.